Good morning. We're going to use Acts 4 to guide our time of gospel remembrance this morning. In Acts 4, Peter and John have just been arrested for preaching in Jesus' name after healing a lame beggar. The memory of Jesus' arrest and crucifixion, it would have been fresh on the hearts and minds of Peter, John, and all those who were there for those events. It was obvious after Calvary that finding yourself on the wrong side of the Jewish religious leaders in Jerusalem could escalate quickly into very real persecution and even death. Yet Peter and John boldly preached the gospel to those religious leaders. This arrest was their first experience since Jesus' ascension of the religious persecution that was to come. By the end of chapter 5, they would be beaten. Saul would soon still kill Stephen, and Christians would be scattered far beyond Jerusalem. James would be martyred, Peter arrested, and this was just the start of the suffering that Christians would experience throughout history, that we may soon have the privilege to experience here in the United States. The future felt uncertain from a worldly perspective. Coming persecution and loss were inevitable. And their response, the early church's response, is a particularly helpful example to us. I've noticed lately that it seems like the state of things in America and the Western world are quickly devolving in a direction back to this historical norm where Christians will be persecuted and suffer worldly loss just for faithfulness to Jesus and God's word. Maybe you're like me, headlines, current events, increasingly bold anti-Christian sentiment in the culture, they tempt me to anxiety and I'm often tempted to feed and what feels like an insatiable desire to read and think about current events. And this can sometimes distract me or tempt to distract me from prayer and devotion to God's word. I found that the early church's God-exalting, gospel-focused response to their first taste of persecution, I found this incredibly instructive and encouraging. So that's where we're going to turn our attention this morning. The words of the Apostles' Prayer from Acts 4.23 helps us get a glimpse into the theology that fueled their boldness in the face of this threat. Let's read Acts 4, 23 through 28. I'm going to be in the ESV. Acts 4, 23. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And only then do they, do they make their first request in prayer for boldness. I want to call your attention to the content of what they prayed. In their prayer, they basically told God who they knew him to be. This is helpful and not always immediately obvious and practiced in our prayers. As they prayed, they told God who they knew him to be. Look down at 423. They proclaimed in prayer first. They proclaimed in prayer God's complete sovereignty over creation. They quoted Exodus 2011 saying, It is you who made the heaven and earth and sea and, is, and all that is in them. They started their prayer by first reminding themselves of God's status as the sovereign creator of all. Then number two, they proclaimed in prayer God's sovereign authorship of scripture. Their prayer is filled with quotes of God's word. 
and they acknowledged to God that these were God's very words. Verse 25, said by the Holy Spirit, as they were written by the hands of men, in this case, David. When we pray, it's right and helpful to use God's own words to guide our prayer. And then third, they proclaimed in prayer God's sovereignty over all, seen most clearly at the cross. Was there ever a worse example of the heinous acts that sinful humans can accomplish than the horrific, merciless murder of the innocent, sinless, only holy Son of God. No, at the cross we see sin on display in all of its sinfulness. And yet, even in this most extreme manifestation of sinfulness, where Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Jewish leaders raged in vain against God, you see that they only did even as they were working out of their full autonomy, their full hatred and wrath against God, they only did whatever your hand and your plan predestined to take place. The cross clearly shows that even, probably especially in the worst of humanity's anti-God rebellion, God reigns. As people sinned boldly, God's perfect will to atone for sins was being worked out. This gospel truth fueled the courage of the early Christians. The Lord sovereignly orchestrates all of history to accomplish exactly his will. Let me say that again. The Lord sovereignly orchestrates all of history to accomplish exactly his will. No virus, no political leader, no election, no ideology, no war, no law, no person, nothing in all of creation can act in any way except to do whatever the Lord's hand and plan have predestined to take place. God took the worst act of human sin, the crucifixion of Jesus, to accomplish the greatest good imaginable for us. And if he is sovereign over the ones that crucified Jesus, he was certainly in control over the leaders, over the rulers who had Jesus, who had Peter and John arrested in Acts 4. And there's no doubt that God totally reigns over any threat that you or I might face. It is right to declare this truth to God as we pray to him. Surveys reveal that those in the world around us feel that the world is spiraling out of control. The culture calls good evil and evil good. The future in many ways feels uncertain, but every bit of it is working to accomplish our Father's wise and perfect goals. It's so helpful as we pray to look back to the cross to remind ourselves of God's sovereign working even in the actions of sinful people. If you haven't turned to Jesus in faith and repentance, if you're not a Christian, if you have not confessed your sins against God to God and trusted in Jesus alone for forgiveness and justification, then God's sovereignty in no way alleviates you of your guilt before him. In fact, you're no less guilty, no less needy than the very ones who crucified the author of life 2,000 years ago to whom Peter pleaded in Acts 3.19. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. And the good news is that your sins may actually be blotted out. If you put your faith in God, then you can know with 100% certainty that all of God's perfect sovereignty will be for you. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not graciously give us all things? So in these turbulent times in which we find ourselves with threats and rumors of threats against Christians on the horizon, with much clamoring for our anxious attention, let's pray. And we're going to follow this model given for us in Acts 4, 23, as we pray. Sovereign Lord, you made everything in just six days by simply speaking. And we have your amazingly powerful words in scripture. 
And yet humanity believes itself to be so wise. The world around us paints us as fools for believing your words as they increasingly array themselves against you. God, you were able to accomplish the greatest good imaginable through the greatest wickedness conceivable at the cross. So we trust that you remain completely in control. Your purposes and your promises cannot be thwarted by laws, changing societal norms, Supreme Court decisions, election, persecutions, or anything else. So God, please grant us a confidence to trust your words as sufficient and true. Grant us courage and boldness to faithfully, patiently, with love and grace, patiently endure evil and speak with boldness and compassion. Jesus Christ to the world around us. God, I pray for Grace Bible Church that you would continue to grant us steadfast confidence in your word that your Holy Spirit would be evident in the way that we love each other and live in self-emptying unity within the church. And may your Holy Spirit's work in us be evident as we live faithful to you as aliens, strangers, and ambassadors in this world, looking forward to the new heaven and new earth that is to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.